Now it is time to introduce Spring Boot and to show how it is used in the sample application. And the purpose of Spring Boot is to simplify creating a Spring application. It should be easier to, to get started with a Spring application, not require such a lot of setup. To understand why Spring Boot was introduced, we should understand the fact that Spring is not really one product, but a collection of different frameworks. Say for example that we are writing a typical web application, then we need for for example a framework for transaction management so that's the transaction management framework maybe we need a persistence framework maybe we need a security framework maybe a framework for handling HTTP communication HTTP communication maybe a framework for creating HTML pages so they are all represented as beans inside the IOC container all these frameworks which are represented as beans must be declared without Spring Boot uh, this declaration had to be done manually and at that point in time quite a long time ago only XML configuration was available so we had to write XML files describing all these beans and not only define them and define all their properties but also how they interacted with each other we had to define connections between them and also had to define yeah all their properties so for example for the persistence we had to define the location of the database username password for connecting to the database and so on so there was a lot of configuration to do and this became quite messy so at some point in time quite a long time ago it actually got so complicated that people stopped using spring and that is uh, I think the main reason why spring boot was initiated the good news then is that now using Spring Boot we don't need to care about the, all this bean configuration. So how does that work? In brief you could say that Spring Boot decides what shall be used based on what is present on the class path and on default settings and then wires all this together. There are lots of fancy words for this, like a convention over configuration or an opinionated view. But basically it means that the creators of Spring Boot decided what is reasonable to use in a web application or application of whatever kind we are creating. So if we want not to use the default settings, we define other settings, for example by putting something else on the class path and then Spring Boot will use that instead of the default. So as an example we could consider servers. Say our application needs a server on the class path, by default Spring Boot has uh, the Tomcat server. So when configuring the server and Spring Boot will use the Tomcat server if nothing is done. But if we want to use for example Jetty instead, we download the, the Jetty jar and make sure also that is on the class path. And then um, Spring Boot will see that the uh, Jetty is on the class path and will use that one instead of the default Tomcat. So to summarize what Spring Boot will do for us, it will configure our entire application it will require a minimal use of configuration files. Actually, if we accept all the default settings, it will not require any configuration files at all. No XML configuration is needed. Not that I'm not saying that XML configuration is bad. I think they presented this way because at some point people got a bit upset with all the XML configuration you, you had to do. And the downside of writing configuration in XML files is that the configuration is very loosely connected to what you are configuring. In one place, in an XML file, you write configurations. And in another place in the Java component you write what is being configured. These are located in completely different places in the file system so you have to somehow in the XML file specify which Java component the configuration is related to and it becomes quite messy. There's no compilation right so it's difficult to get appropriate error messages. That's the downside of XML configuration. The positive thing is of course that well it's the same they are very loosely connected so you can edit the XML configuration without having to recompile or change anything in the actual program that's the rationale behind using such configuration files the alternative is mainly annotations placed exactly at the Java component that is being configured some annotation that is placed for example at the class with the source code here the configuration and the thing that is being configured are very closely coupled and the positive thing is when you look at the Java source code it's easy to see what configuration is done because it's exactly there the downside then is the same thing, they are this tightly coupled. To change configuration you have to change the source code and recompile. 
And not only is there minimal use of config files and no XML configuration, but also minimal Java configuration with annotations and by setting bean properties by calling setter methods. So Spring Boot will also create a jar file which contains the entire application, including the server. So the entire application becomes self-contained in this single jar file. To run the application, we simply run the jar. And this makes it very appropriate for cloud environments. But we will not deploy to any cloud environment in this course. We'll just run the jar with the server locally. Finally, it should be noted that the jar with the entire application configured and the server has production quality. It is not just for testing. Those are the main features of Spring Boot. Now let's have a look at how this is done and how Spring Boot is used in the sample application. To use Spring Boot it is strongly recommended to use a build tool that supports dependency management and we are going to use Maven which is a very frequently used build tool. Actually Maven is used in all sample applications in the course but we are going to use it to a bigger extent in this application. So I will not give a complete overview of Maven but by no means just briefly show what it is used for in this example. With Maven we can define which frameworks are used and Maven will then download them. We define which uh, jar files are needed. The frameworks are packaged in jar files. Maven will download them and will also download their dependencies. So let's say that we de declare that we are using framework A and framework A needs jar B. Then we do not have to declare jar B because Maven will see that the framework A needs jar B and then download jar B. So we just define which jar files or which frameworks our application needs and, and then Maven will download everything that's required. Uh, and Maven will also compile our application and will package the entire application including the downloaded jars in a jar file. And Maven can be used for a lot of other things as well but this is mainly what we'll use for in this example. Also, with the help of a plugin from Spring Boot, we will run the application using Maven. Now let's have a look at the sample application and see some of the beauty of Spring Boot. So a Maven project is defined in a POM file. POM is short for Project Object Model. Okay, so this is the POM file of the sample application. And I'm not expecting you to understand it in detail and by no means to write it. You just use this POM file that is included in the sample application. However, I want to briefly explain it to show how Spring Boot works. Now, I promised no XML <laughs> configuration, didn't I? But the thing is, this POM file is for the Maven project. It's not the Spring configuration file. It's the Maven configuration file and we have to live with that one. But as I said, you can just reuse this existing one. Now, thanks to Spring Boot, this is quite short and just with this short file we are going to get a load of Spring projects and frameworks and things also not part of Spring. First there is a parent section which tells what this project inherits from and it inherits from something called Spring Boot Starter Parent. And that is a project which includes a load of Spring frameworks. So we get them for free without having to define them one by one. This Spring Boot starter parent also defines a plugin from Maven that allows us to run the Spring application. Then there is a section with dependencies. And here in a typical Maven project we define all frameworks we are using. But again there is a Spring Boot feature here. It's all this Spring Boot starter something. We have Spring Boot starter web which includes everything related to a web application. We have Spring Boot starter thymeleaf which includes things related to Thymeleaf, which is the framework we are going to use for HTML generation. Then we have Spring Boot Starter Data JPA, which includes everything related to persistence with JPA. So those are like meta dependencies from Spring Boot. This relatively short POM is in fact resolved to something much longer. I will show you the effective POM after having inherited everything from the parent and downloaded the starter dependencies. So I like to use the command line interface to Maven. So I'll use that one now and then I'll also show how to do it in IntelliJ. Anyway, Maven help effective POM. 
this thing here with a load of dependencies much more than was declared in the file we just saw is what is actually generated is the effective pom that is used and here are all the dependencies on different frameworks that are included from the parent we inherited from and from the starter dependencies we can do the same thing in IntelliJ by right clicking here and then we choose maven show effective pom it's long also here it's the same of course so that was just to show what actually was included I'll show one more thing, namely the dependency tree. Here in this tree-like thing we can see dependencies. So we have the Spring Boot Starter web here and we can see that it includes the Spring Boot Starter which in turn includes some other jars here and so on and then going from Starter web which was here right we also come to this thing that was included Starter JSON and then we have Starter Tomcat so this is where the Tomcat server is included since we declared the Spring Boot Starter web dependency also the Tomcat starter which contains everything related to Tomcat was included validation of input in HTML forms yeah and other things and then we have the uh, thyme leaf starter we also saw in the pom file here which includes thyme leaf related things here and then we have the data JPA thing here that includes everything that is related to persistence with JPA okay that was a brief overview of maven and the pom file so now let's have a look at the actual source code and see how spring boot is used there i realize that from what i've said previously you might get the impression that spring boot is something that is used before the application is started like to package it that's true to the extent that we saw things related to spring boot in the pom file but remember that it's mainly about instantiating beans and wiring them together and beans are objects, so they cannot live outside the actual application running in the JVM. Okay, so now let's see what happens in the application. So Spring Boot is executed when the application is started. This is the main class and the main method of the application. Essentially, there are only two lines here, at least only two lines related to Spring. It's this line here and this line here. First, let's have a look at this line. So that is the entire main method. What it does is it boots the Spring application. This method, the static method run in the class Spring application, will start the IOC container and load all beans. And as you know by now, load beans means quite a lot. Everything is a bean right in Spring, so, so load beans means to start everything. So why do we include this class main dot class here well it's because we could have been definitions in here in this class actually that is the recommended approach but I split it I wanted to keep main clean and not have it do anything but start the program so I put the configuration and definitions in another class that we'll see later okay anyway so this static method run creates the IOC container and populates it with the beans both the default beans according to spring boot and those that we declared ourselves then let's have a look at this annotation Spring Boot application. Actually, it's just one annotation and no parameters, but it does quite a lot. It is, in fact, a convenience annotation that exists only to group three other annotations. One is configuration. Remember from when we talked about bean definitions that bean creator methods could be declared in a class annotated configuration. And this class is such a class because configuration annotation is included in the Spring Boot application annotation. But as I said, there are no bean creator methods there because I split and moved those into another class. This class only starts the application. So that's the first annotation included in Spring Boot application. The second one is component scan. Remember that the other way to declare beans what was to place the annotation component at the class. But then how does Spring find those classes annotated with component? Well, it scans all packages we tell it to scan. And that's defined with the component scan annotation. So this annotation enables this component scanning. It looks for classes with the component annotation and objects of those classes can be beans. And where will it look? If we specify nothing else, it will look in the current package which is this one and in all sub packages that is anything dot whatever comes here dot domain or whatever that is the reason that this main class should be placed in a root package just sekth id 12 12 observe bank no layer then it will scan all the sub packages okay and the third annotation 
enable auto configuration that starts the Spring Boot auto configuration. We have not specified anything else, so it just runs the entire auto configuration. If we want some configuration to not be done, then we have to tell that, and more about that also later. So that's the Spring Boot application annotation. Let's have a look at it in the API documentation as well. So here's the API documentation for the Spring Boot application annotation. And you can see here it has these three annotations. Component scan, enable auto configuration, and okay, Spring Boot configuration, which is used here instead of configuration. But as far as we are concerned, it's identical to the configuration annotation. In fact, if we were happy with all the defaults, that would be all that was required. But there are some settings that are not the default ones in this application. Therefore, there is some more configuration. And I will explain that in more detail later when I talk about the application as such. But I'll just show you briefly now. So it is here in bank config. Here you can see the configuration annotation. And note that this is in the sub package of bank where the main was located. So it will be included in the component scan. And the configuration is an annotation that implies the component annotation. If we look here in the API documentation. We see that the annotation configuration includes the component annotation. That means that the component scan will find the configuration files as well. So here are some bean creator methods and a few other configurations. Not that big, but there's some things that need to be done, even though we're using Spring Boot. This is both the good news and the bad news about Spring. The good news is that it's big and very flexible and you can do a lot of things. And the bad news is that there's relatively much configuration, even though we're using Spring Boot. Okay, so there's some in here and then there's also a property file. It's called application.properties. Again, I'll not go through all the properties. We'll look at that later when talking about the application. I'll just show you that this file also includes some configuration. And these properties are translated to properties in Beans by Spring. Okay, so that was an overview of Spring Boot.